one. Well, hey, Dave Melinda here, Positive Polarity Podcast. Hope things are going awesome for you this week. I got a great question that I know the answer to, but it's one of those you got to ask anyway, right? And the question is, is how important is financial freedom to you? And along with that, is what does that mean to you? What does financial freedom mean? And I share with you as often as I can on this show that I'm not a money guy. I leave that to the money people. So I had to get a guy that could help us answer that question. So I'm honored to be hanging out with Jeff Kickle. How are you today, sir? I am fantastic. Thanks for the invite, Dave. Absolutely. You're founder and president at Freedom Day Wealth Management. So fill mm -hmm. us in on what is Freedom Day. Tell us about that. Well, Freedom Day, it's its interesting. You know, I've been in the retirement business for almost 30 years. Um, about, uh, let's call it 2012, 2013, I started to see a shift in the industry a little bit, uh, primarily from the client perspective. And yeah. what, I, what I always say is there's kind of a split right there at that time period. And you have a generation of people that are post- four-hour work week. So for those of you that don't know, four-hour work week was written by a guy named Tim, Tim Ferriss in 2007. So people that came of age after four-hour work week came out have a really different mindset when it comes to, you know, retirement and everything else. You know, the traditional retirement of wait for 40 years, you know, put away every cent you can, don't really live life, and then once you get to age 65 or 66, you downsize your home, put on black socks and sandals and take one cruise per year. And that's your life for the next 40 years. There you, um, go. you know, that generation looked at that and went, oh, no, that, I'm not doing that. I want to live the life that Tim did. So I want to yeah. be able to have a job or a business where I can basically live anywhere in the world and do all of that. So that, okay. you know, that generation had a way different thought about retirement, you know, and when I would have discussions with them about it, they looked at me like I had two heads and said, no, I don't want that. That's not what I'm looking for. I want to be able to live life today and I don't need to save. Well, big mistake there. Uh, the other generation were people of my generation and older, you know, Gen X that grew up, you know, the kids of baby boomers. And those baby boomers, you know, they were hard workers. They worked for one job most of their lives. And that's what yep. they taught us. You know, hey, you're, you know, you go to school, you get a great job, you stay at that job for 40 years, then you get to downsize your house, wear black socks and sandals and take one cruise per year. Yep. Um, you know, and what had happened was, you know, people of my generation and older went through the downturn of 2000 to 2003, which included, you know, 9-11. Yep. Then the market just kind of went sideways for 10 years. <laughs> then when we thought everything was going to get there, all of a sudden 2008 to 2010 happened and blew all that up. So, you know, for 2000 and let's call it 2001 to 2011, that generation, our generation had effectively a 0% return during that time period. So we lost an entire decade of our retirement. So the people that were my age and older were getting to the point where they're like, I followed all the rules and this sure. didn't work. Sure. <laughs> and I'm yeah. not going to get to retire. I'm going to be working for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So I would start to do financial planning for people. And, you know, the people that were older had that kind of, oh, God, I'm going to be working forever. I'm never going to be able to get there. And a lot of times people didn't need as much as they thought. And sure. when we would do planning, I, you know, I, I would get to the point and I'm like, okay, I can run the numbers in my head and know that you're going to succeed because you don't really spend that much money. And one day I just happened to be talking to a client. And I mean, he was ridiculously prepared, had millions of dollars, didn't really spend much money. And, you know, we started talking and I said, you know what, you got up and you went to work today and you didn't have to. You did. You mm -hmm. went to work because you wanted to, not because you had to. You didn't financially sure. have to do it. You have your freedom day. And all of a sudden, the smile kind of came on his face. And that's the point where I stopped using the R word and started mm -hmm. using freedom day. 
And Freedom Day is just the first day you wake up, you have enough income and you have enough income and assets to not have to go to work that day. You now have a work optional lifestyle. And so I started talking to people about that and I stopped focusing on what the retirement industry does really bad, which is, okay, you've got to save, you know, X amount of dollars. Most cases it's, you know, multi millions of dollars to be able to live the lifestyle that you're used to today. Well, sure. that's wrong. <laughs> it, I mean, it's quite frankly wrong. And the reason is because the financial industry that I grew up in, primarily the ones who train us on how to do our job are mutual fund companies, brokerage firms, insurance companies, who their job is to acquire assets. So what are they trying to train us to do? We're trying, they're trying to train us to help gather assets. They pay us that way in our industry. And mm -hmm. effectively, it turns out to be a lie. Uh, because you you don't need to focus on the asset part as much as you need to focus on what that asset can generate from an income stream. You got to focus on cash flow and not on the end asset. Hmm. Wow. There's a ton there. So I want to go all the way back to the four hour work week. So I, yep. I heard the book. I, I can say I've never read it. Wow. Um, well, and oddly enough, I don't know, maybe I'm weird, Jeff, but like a yeah. four hour work week doesn't even really, ex that doesn't even interest me. Yeah. So I don't know, again, if I'm just speaking, like, I don't, I don't even know if that's, I don't know. So, I just so think the funny about thing it. With, yeah. The I funny thing with Tim when day, he, so. yeah, well, the funny thing is Tim wrote the book. He, I mean, he will tell you right out of the gate that it's not what the book is about. It was, he tested the title. And so this is back, you know, 2007, this is back in the days when there wasn't a lot as far as the internet goes. And so he sure. tested that with a series of Google ads. He tested all these different titles and that was the one that got the best response. And gotcha. that's why the book is named the four hour work week. Well, it didn't work for me because I didn't read the book because of it. So obviously I hope other yeah. people, I hope other people will read yeah. it. I like the freedom I like the financial freedom concept. I like yep. the fact that you're working because you have to, not because you want to, or you work or scratch because that, you want reverse to, not because, <laughs> yeah, not because you want to, you're working, not because you have to, because you want to, sorry for the third it. time. Um, but I think that a lot of entrepreneurs that are listening kind of get stuck in that same spot as well. And as yep. I coach people, Jeff, I'm asking the question, and maybe this isn't the right question, but I ask them, like, when is enough enough? Mm -hmm. You know, how many more 16-hour days do you have to do? Or how many more companies do you need to start? I mean, and again, mm -hmm. I'm not here to, to judge, say, one's right or one's wrong. Yeah. Do you run into a lot of people that just keep accumulating and they really don't even know why they're accumulating? Yeah, because they don't have anything outside of that. Um, okay. you know, one of the things I believe in life is we don't, and this is something, you know, once again, my industry is so hyper-focused on the money side of things that they don't focus on the psychology side of it. Okay. And, okay. you know, I, we, we find this the same, you know, I, I do a lot of coaching and, and consulting with business owners that are going to sell their business. And, you know, mm -hmm. we spend as much time on the financial stuff as we talk about what's life after your business. What are you going to, you know, because the answer I get a lot of times is, well, you know, I mean, what I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to sleep in. Okay, well, that's three days. Uh, what are you going to do after that? Well, you yeah. know, I'm going to go play golf. Okay, so I can't think of anything worse than getting up and playing golf every single day of my life. Uh, yeah. So what are you going to do after that? Well, I might volunteer. Okay, so you do that for an hour or so a week. What are you going to do with the other 168 hours during the week? And right. what ends up happening is these are typically pretty high, you know, they're high speed, low drag people to begin with. And what they're not doing is they're not filling their lives with something of importance, something that drives them, something that makes them excited. So what do they end up doing? Well, they just go and start another business because that'll be something that'll, you know, occupy my time and, you know, right. lightning struck once. So it's obviously got to strike again. And, yeah. you know, half the time they start building another business and this one doesn't, you know, they, they were, 
<laughs> there's that one in five chance that you're going to have a successful business. And now you're doing the four of five and you're <laughs> sinking your money and time into something that's just never going to happen. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No. And like I told you early before we jumped on, you know, we've been hosting in San Diego. And so yeah. to have a, a open a shop in San Diego for snowmobiles and shovels is right. <laughs> you yeah. could have the best <laughs> intentions, but if you sold it like in the wrong market, Wisconsin as well. So in yeah. Wisconsin, that that would do well. Uh, obviously in San Diego, not. So I love the thought that you yeah. have. And I think it's a warning to people just because you were successful at one business does yep. not mean necessarily sure can happen, but the, I wouldn't the, bank yeah. on it automatically that it's in a lot of happen. cases too. They, uh, they have money because they sold their business and yeah. they don't, they don't start that new business as a starving business. Um, I'm of the belief that a business needs to starve a little bit. It's got to be hungry. It's got to have a little bit of rib showing to yeah. it if you're going to start a business. And when you have all the money in the world, you're just going to keep dumping money into, you know, putting good money towards bad in those cases. Right. You know, and I even found this, I know better. And I even found this when, you know, I sold my business and that that gave me my freedom day. And then I ended up dumping money into stupid crap. That I'm like, I wish I had had that money back now because I could use it for other things. Um, yeah. So it doesn't, yeah, you know, doesn't mean that I don't make the same dumb mistakes and I make the same dumb mistakes over again uh, that sure. I did. But I've, I've kind of, you know, especially in this last year, um, I really started to build businesses, starving businesses again, um, income streams that are kind of starving businesses and make them kind of live or die at that point. And, you know, sure. all I do now, I mean, my, my job today is to create more and more income streams for myself and my family. Gotcha. Sure. Gotcha. Well, and so when you talk about financial planning for yourself mm -hmm. and for your clients, yep. um, why is that so important to reach that um, freedom day? It, it sounds to me like it's a, I should be planning in my twenties or my 60s. That's what we've been telling people, throw in as much money as you can in your 401k That's, and yep. blah, 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 blah. Um, so why, but on your world, in your world, the financial yeah. planning yeah. part, why is that important to reach? Well, that? A, a, yeah, Freedom Day Blueprint's a little bit of a different animal. Um, okay. You know, once again, it's retraining the way we're taught to think. So what are we taught to think originally? Well, okay, you start saving in your 20s and you save eight to 10% of your money for 40 years and you know, you'll be there. Okay, great. That's fine. That one that says you're gonna keep doing that consistently, which most people don't. Yeah. Two, that assumes that you're gonna have the money sitting in, let's say, an SP 500 fund during that time period. Well, People do that and then they go, oh, well, here's something better over here. And so they move money over there and they lose money on it. And then, oh, crap, now I'll move it over here. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at the Dalbar study, which was done by the Dalbar Institute, for the last 30 years, the average annual return for individual investors, you know, non-professional investors is about 5.8%. That's okay. half of what the S&P 500 has done. So okay. they're not going to make it. That's, that's what I call the retirement trap. They're not going to make it because they're thinking the wrong way. What we do with the Freedom Day method is we go the opposite. We look at it and we say, okay, what does it take to get to my Freedom Day? So the first thing we do, step one, is we determine what we call our minimum required income. And it's really simple for those of you that are out there. You take what you bring in on a monthly basis, your income, and you take your expenses and those expenses, you want to go through and you want to mark them as either a need or a want. Okay. Need or want. And then you just add up all your needs. And that is your minimum required income. That's what you need to make. So you yeah. want to look at your you want to look at your income first and your needs. And it's like, OK, if, if you have more money than the needs, OK, we're good. So that's our okay. minimum required income. If you do the needs and your income is less. We got a problem. Houston, we got a problem. We either need to raise income or we need to reduce expenses. So once wow. we have our MRI, the difference that I put into the, the Freedom Day method from what most of the industry teaches is what, is what does the industry teach? 
okay, have this dream of retirement some far way, 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 way out here. Yep. Now start saving for that. Okay, well, I have no reward system. I just keep saving and maybe or maybe not, it gets there in 40 years. So the second step that we do is we have people create a bucket list. 100 items in 10 different categories. So 10 items in each category. And it's everything from you know, travel goals, adventure goals, um, health goals, uh, mental health goals, relationships, things you want to buy, things right. like that. And so you create that list. And then what we do to get them started is we have them pick out three things on that list of 100 that cost less than $500 and can be done in six months or less. Okay. Okay. So now I've got my I've got my goals, my three goals, and then we're going to start retraining our brain a little bit. So mm -hmm. a lot of the people that we're talking to that were, you know, that I write about or I write to in my books and everything else are people that get up, go to work for a paycheck every day. So they're used to I trade my time for a paycheck. Right. The difference here is okay, we got to retrain our brain a little bit because if we live that life of a paycheck, what do we get? We have a life of a paycheck. I, you know, if I say, well, here's my five goals and it's $500. Well, what's the answer? It's either I can't afford that on my salary or I can't, um, you know, I, I'll just put it on credit and do it. No, neither of those. What I want you to start thinking is how am I going to pay for that? And how I'm going to pay for it is I'm going to figure out a way to create a little side hustle. Yeah, side hustle could be as simple as I'm going to go drive Uber, and you sure. can drive Uber and make 500 bucks like that. I mean, it's no yeah. no at all. Sure, you could create a little side hustle business for yourself. Go online. Maybe you have certain skills that you could sell to somebody online, uh, and you provide value instead of time for your, your money. Hmm. Wow. Well, and that's interesting because now we're, retrain your brain is I wrote that down because that now all of a sudden brings us into a whole different level mm -hmm. of right now we got, there's things we have to do. So many people are looking for get rich quick schemes. It's pretty, you don't have to retrain your brain to throw 3% into your 401k, your employee matches your 3%, you're getting 6% of a hundred grand or whatever. So $6,000 every year is going in and you just, you know, um, I struggle with that because we had a neighbor that did that exact thing. And they, six months after retirement, he had a heart attack and died. So he spent his whole life getting to build this house that he wanted mm. to build and all this stuff. And then he dies yep. uh, and it's a disaster. And and so, never lived his life at that point. Yeah. All he did was do the, the other piece. So is part of this concept here um, with the Freedom Day is in, it's, it, I kind of feel like you're going to enjoy the ride. It's more mm -hmm. about the journey as opposed to the destination. That's I mean, precisely correct. Okay. And, and, yeah, and, and I mean, yeah. you know, the, the way I'm looking at it is, okay, so we retrain our brain. So, all right, for six months, we have three goals and we're trying to hit $500 or less, whatever that cost of that goal is. By those three and six months, all of a sudden you start to realize, wow, you know what? I, if I did that three times, I could probably do it a fourth or a fifth at that sure. point. So now all of a sudden they start thinking, all right, well, okay, how can I get this? How can I do this? So now all of a sudden debt doesn't sound so bad. You know, I'm $30,000 in debt. And, you know, now that the government started to make me pay for my student loans and all that, okay, how can I pay off those student loans? How can I get rid of that credit card debt? How can I, you know, get myself to where, okay, maybe I can start saving more or how can I replace my existing income that I need sure. my MRI? Sure. Gotcha. Wow. That's pretty cool. Um, I want to take a break. And when we come back, Jeff, I want to talk about the three secrets of a successful and profitable business that you have. So we're going to yep. take a quick break and we'll be right back. 
Welcome back. I'm talking with Jeff Kickle, who is the founder and president of Freedom Day Wealth Management. Thank you again so much for hanging out. I love any time we can try to do something different, right? Rather than retirement, let's think of it in a different light. Freedom Day is a really cool uh, concept there. You talk about in your in your writings and in your work, you talk about three secrets of a successful and profitable business. There's mm. a lot of entrepreneurs from around the world that listen in each week. And so they're probably going, yes, this is what I really want to learn about. Um, mm. So can you share with us those secrets that you found, Jeff? Well, I think, you know, the first secret is you got to know your numbers. I mean, it's, it, I, and, it, and honestly, it's no different from the individual that's working for somebody. You've got to know your numbers. So if you're one of those people that's just not a numbers person, uh, figure it out quick. Because if you don't know how much is coming in, how much is going out, I guarantee you there's more going out than you even think that you have. Um, I, and I made this mistake. You know, I come from a finance background, but when I started businesses, I was so busy focused on just selling and building the business. And I wasn't really watching those numbers until I had a really, really good bookkeeper that kind of kept me to task. And every month she would print out, literally she'd print out every single transaction that I had in my business for that month. And she would sit down and we would spend an hour and she would make me go through line by line exactly what was this? What was it for? Why did you do it? What's all this? Is this, you know, I saw this as a repetitive thing, you know, month after month. Is this something that you're using or not? And, you know, it made me be very disciplined in my business. So, you know, first thing, you got to know your numbers. Second tell me piece that of wasn't this, the first. Tell me that wasn't the most painful hour of your week, Joe. Oh my God. It was horrible. Yeah. Cause I mean, it was like, some of these, it's funny because a lot of them, I'm, I'm a big tech guy. So I love tools and stuff like that. Sure, and, sure. You know, I, I fall for it all the time of, Oh yeah, it's only 25 bucks a month until you add, yep. you know, 10, 25 bucks a month right? together. It oh starts adding up, um, you know, and it, it, it made me be disciplined about, okay, am I even using this tool? No, yeah. I haven't used it in three months. You know what? Get rid of it. If I need yeah. it, I can always subscribe again. And I've never, most cases, I never went back and subscribed to that tool again. So, Great stuff. you know, Thank absolutely you. the most painful week, month, you know, hour of my month, but I still do that today. I don't even work oh, with the wow. bookkeeper anymore, but I sure. still do that exercise every single month. And, wow. you know, it's kept me very disciplined. It got us through the pandemic. Um, sure. One of the businesses I own is a physical business where people come in. It's co-working space. Okay. Sure. And had we not been that disciplined, yeah. uh, and that was, you know, when that happened, it was like, okay, we got to be really disciplined. What can we kill at sure. this point? And then stayed sure. on top of that. And that got us through uh, where wow. a lot of our competitors didn't. Yeah. Um, you know, second thing is you have got to get yourself out of your business. Um, you know, I have so many people that I talk to that effectively all they did was they, they left working for somebody else and just bought a job or created right. a job for themselves and they're self-employed, but the business is them. If they stop yeah. working, it's done. So yeah. you've got to get to the point where you start to create systems and then those systems have got to be able to be run without you directly being involved. Now, it could be automation that's doing a lot of this and you can keep your staff pretty small or you create systems that you can have employees execute for you where you are not involved. Um, sure. And this was a hard one for me. I'm a systems guy. I would create systems and then I would run the systems and not have employees run the system. Um, sure. And I was the guy who, you know, I was proud of, Oh man, I work 70, 80 hours a week and everything else. The best thing that ever happened was the pandemic because uh, yeah. it made me slow down, made me realize mm -hmm. that there's actually life outside of the office. Yeah. And I massively slowed my life down, uh, began to enjoy life again. My wife and I actually, you know, we would go out for dinner after work instead of me wheeling in at seven o'clock at night. Sure. Um, so that, you know, that's the next thing is got to get yourself out of your business. And then the final thing is 
the realization that every business that is a, a family based business, you know, some a human owns it, yeah, is going to change hands at some point, and you have to have a plan for that. So whether it is, hey, I'm going to hand that business to my kids, whether I'm going to sell it to somebody else, whether I'm going to hand slowly hand this over or sell it to key employees within the business, at some point in time, that business is going to change hands. Most of our businesses are not big S&P 500 companies that exist without the, you know, the owners of the company being involved. So sure, you've sure. got to have a plan to transition that business to the other side, you know, and, and so part of that plan is making sure you have a profitable business, um, which is step one, but yeah. making sure you have a clear cut picture of what that exit is going to be like, and that it's a, you know, a, a light at the end of the tunnel and it's not an oncoming train coming at you. <laughs> Wow. So know your numbers, get out mm -hmm. of your business and plan for that transition away from you. Yep. Um, yeah, those are interesting because, uh, I mean, I'm sure know the numbers we've heard a lot before. That's probably a pretty common thought process, but getting out of your business, you know, I mean, speak to this for, and probably more for me, Jeff, than anybody I mean, I'm a solopreneur, right? I mm -hmm. mean, I'm a coach. They, they People buy my time. They buy my knowledge. They buy that from me. Um, whether that's right or wrong, that's how we have it set up. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. I mean, how do you, how would you, for somebody listening that's in that same spot, you know, where they don't have a product or they don't have necessarily a uh a patent or, you know, they don't have that. Mm -hmm. They're, they're selling their knowledge. How would yeah. you, how would you um, sh help them along that journey? Well, I mean, it's one of two things. So I, when I talk to people that are in that boat, you know, and it's typically coaches uh, when I, when I deal with coaches or consultants, you know, I mean, you're, you're in a, a situation where you, you're selling you in most cases. Right. So it's very difficult yep. to transition you to someone else, unless right. you've created some type of coaching technique that is sure. used, you know, so you, if you create a system that is a repeatable system, and this is where I've seen the most successful coaches. I mean, think of, you know, the, the, probably the guy who had the hardest time with this was Tony Robbins because Tony Robbins was Tony Robbins. I mean, everything yeah, sure. about him was Tony Robbins. Yeah. And it wasn't until Tony, although he's still there, I mean, he's very much identifiable as this well-known coach, yeah. but Tony does very, very little individualized coaching anymore. Tony has created systems and then Tony has taken gotcha. people sure. and taught those systems to other people for money. Yeah. And those people now can affect a lot more people than Tony can. Um, and then Tony was able to take his business sure. yeah. and sell his business. And that's where, you know, I mean, it's, he, he went from being a millionaire to a billionaire pretty yeah. fast okay. by being able to do that and be able to sell wow. his business. So, I mean, I that's like to have you him have to as do. your coach. eh? Oh yeah. It'd be <laughs> awesome. But yeah, I mean, if you can, I mean, if you want to spend 40 grand a year and go hang out at yeah. a private Island with him, um, yeah. you know, 40 or 50 grand a year can get you in with a lot of people, some really key people in the world. Uh, sure. You just got to come up with the 40 or 50 grand to do sure, that. Sure. Yep. Um, you know, and then the other side of the coin is for people that are in that boat. You know, if, if somebody is in that boat and they're like, well, I just don't really want to create any kind of training program or anything like that. Okay. Well then start to look at other sources of, or other income streams, diversify yeah. your income stream. So it's not just that one, gotcha. you, know, sure. you know, I mean, I have 18 distinct separate income streams that I have coming in on a monthly basis. So I get 18 separate checks or 18 separate, you know, basically deposits of money sure. well, into my accounts, into three sure. different businesses every single month, whether I do any work or I don't do any work. I'm going to have those things coming in every single month. Nice. Wow. That's funny. Oh my gosh. 
I think about, I mean, I've had two jobs in 40 years and I own both my companies and right. I mean, I, so I am totally guilty of working for myself, right. Where it's like, I'm still head down. Um, I Mm -hmm. love the thought process of opening my mind up to other income streams. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I think that, that, that's really cool. I want to switch as we start to land the plane today, Jeff, I want to kind of switch because there's some people listening that haven't made the transition. They're still in a job they don't like. Mm -hmm. They're still in what we would call a dead end job, right? Or they haven't, they don't know how to jump into being an entrepreneur. They have maybe an entrepreneur heart, but they don't know what to do. Um, Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for those people that might be, you know, wanting to do what you're telling us to do? Is there kind of like Mm -hmm. a couple easy steps that we can take right up front? Yeah. So, uh, and that person that you're talking about, I call a cubicle warrior. Uh, They're that person that puts on the the armor every day, goes home or goes to work, sits down in the cubicle and dies just a little bit every day. Um, So, those folks, I mean, here's my recommendation. I was, I was you at one time, you know, I was that person that went to a cubicle every day and I died just a little bit. And I always knew I wanted to start my own business and I tried and then it would be like, ah, it's getting hard. And I I make way more money doing this. So I'm just going to focus on this. It wasn't until I got to the point where I hated the last job I had that forced me kind of down that path. So here's what you do. A very, very simple thing to do. And this, I'll give you my story with this. When I first launched off and started my own businesses, um, they weren't making a whole lot of money. And I gave up a really nice income, six figure plus income, went and basically I went to a five figure income (laughs) for quite a bit of time. And, you know, you don't just get rid of expenses as easily as possible. So I needed a way to make money. So I kind of did a little bit of a, skills, you know, all right, skills brainstorming session. What is it that I do well that other people might want? And one of the things that I have a weird superpower for is writing business plans that can help people get funding through a bank, Hmm. uh, which is a really interesting skill set for businesses that need that. And most people that need that don't have that skill. So sure. I decided, well, I'm, I can just write business plans for people. I know this. I've got a template for it. And so what I started doing to make a little side money when we were starting out is I started to do that. So I went to Upwork.com and I went on there and I said, hey, I do business plans. I put my information out there and I started having people reach out to me. Well, I started doing this at a really low amount, about $50 an hour. So for the average okay business, they were only paying me $500 for 10 hours of my time, Um, which, I mean, it wasn't enough to pay the bills, but it started to get me to where I could build my my business up. And I started to get some reviews and everything else. And I would just give them every possible thing I could, give them a ton of value so that I got great reviews. Sure. And then every client after that, I would just raise my price. I would double my price. And so I kept going up, 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 got it to the point where it was about $1,500 per plan, which was still far sure. below everybody else. <laughs> yep. And I kept doing that. And so I would do about four or five of those a month. I still had enough time to build my other businesses and do that. Well, what happened was I started getting to the point where I, my businesses were taking too much time and I didn't have the time to do this. So I hired a guy through Upwork who was in India. He had come to the United States. He has an MBA from, I think, Stanford or something like that. Went back to India because he wanted to live there. And, you know, for $250, he would basically take my plan that I'd put together I had the intro, the intro appointment with the client and the delivery appointment. He would do all the work in the middle for two hundred and fifty dollars. Mm. So now I'm netting twelve hundred and fifty dollars. He's netting two fifty. Nice. We're both sure. happy. His two fifty is probably way the hell more than my twelve hundred <laughs> um, in India. It goes a lot yeah. farther. Well, we started to get really good at this, and he started to take more and more of the time away. So he began to get to the point where he could do the front end. All that, and then I would be on the back end to deliver that to the client. Well, eventually got to the point where he was just kind of running that. I was just, I was 
the figurehead for the business sure. And sure. running the show. And eventually I got to the point where I, it was not enough for me to enjoy it that much anymore. I ended up just giving yeah. the business to him at that point. But okay. it was a way I went from active income, me doing mm-hmm. everything, to yep. passive income where somebody else, an employee, was using a system that I'd created and was able to execute on that system. So you're saying start, find something you're good at as kind of a side hustle? Yeah. Start there. Start yeah. there with your with your three bucket list items where yeah. you can make 500 bucks. I mean- if I had done that plan, I didn't do this, but if I had done that plan, you know, within three months, I would have done all three of my, my bucket list goals. And I would have still sure. had a business that was kicking off 500 bucks a month, at least sure. yeah. um, it was kicking off a lot more than that. And, you know, for me, it was, okay, we can either eat or not eat. So I've got to make this thing happen. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Wow. That's so cool. I want to go way back as we land today to you mm. talked about a bucket list. Is yep. that something that is that like a form that you have or is that if somebody yeah. listening, if that like spurred them uh, as much as it did me? I'm just curious, where where would we find that? So if you go to uh, www.theretirementtrapbook.com, um, there is you can actually sign on to that site and sign up and there's actually a whole bunch of these little tools that are part of that so i've got i've got but you know budgeting tools that are part of it i've got bucket list tool all this stuff so just a bunch of little guided worksheets to take people through that process so it's the retirement trap Trap book book all one word right the retirement trap book.com you got it oh that's so cool Hey, one last thing here, Jeff, and I'm going to let you go. Um, what would your tip of the day be for somebody listening? Uh, maybe it's something that we covered. Uh, maybe it's just something that is burning inside you that you want to get out. But what's for somebody listening? Uh, what's one thing uh, that we can walk away with today? Take action. Okay. Take action. You know, the the problem is there's a ton of courses and books and everything out there and people consume that. You know, I, I write books. So I want you to consume those books, but more than anything, I want you to take action. So just pick one thing that you can do today. Uh, This is something I got from Tony Robbins a long time ago. It's a, you know, put things down in a massive action plan, figure out what needs to be done, what the steps are, and then just pick one thing that you need to do to get that started and then do one thing at least every single day to get that process going. Oh, that's so cool. And we say that every time on our show is, you know what, rather than jump into your next activity, jump onto your next podcast, you know, sit with what, you know, was said here by Jeff and and kind of find one thing. I know for me, I'm going to go to theretirementtrapbook.com and I'm going to understand better that bucket list thing because I feel like that was so revelatory for me. So thank you mm-hmm. um, for sharing that. If people want to learn more about you, Jeff, if they want to connect with you, if something mm-hmm. we talked about today really yep. sparked them, what's the best way for people to reach out to you? Find me. Uh, yeah, find me on uh, LinkedIn. That's the easiest place to find me is LinkedIn. I'm on there every single day. I, I post a ton of stuff on there. So yeah, just find me there, connect with me, uh, follow and connect with me and just make a note that, you know, if you, if you DM me directly, just make a note that you were, you know, you've been listening to Dave's podcast and you've got some questions, glad to answer questions for you. I, the, the thing that I realized is there was no way on earth individually coaching one person at a time that I could ever help as many people as need to be helped. So, sure. you know, through all the stuff that I do, hopefully you'll be able to get there, but I am there. If, if you've got questions, I'm always there to answer them. That's great. And you have the Freedom Nation podcast as well. Yes, sir. So for people listening, uh, if you want to jump over to Freedom Nation podcast, he has six books. I mean, there's a ton of stuff. There's jeffkickle.com. So there is a ton. So if you walk away today as a listener and your life doesn't change, I'm not going to feel bad. 
Jeff's Jeff's not going to feel bad because we gave you a huge boost, a huge push in the right direction. So I hope that you take us up on that or him specifically. Um, thank you, Jeff, so much for all this. And again, I'm going to the retirement trap book.com because I, I can't wait to, to dive into that. And again, thank you for all you're doing and can't wait to keep learning from you. You're welcome. you're welcome. All right. Thanks, Dave. And for those of you out there listening, you know, make sure that you're giving Dave a five star review on the podcast. He's got a phenomenal podcast and this is not an easy job. Uh, it's fun, but it's, it seems like you're talking to the the wall sometimes. <laughs> so <laughs> make sure you let them know that you're out there and put some comments out there. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. And yes, check out the Freedom Nation podcast as well and uh, add that to your day. And again, how important is financial freedom to you? What does it mean to you? Those are questions you get to answer for yourself. So until next week, uh, appreciate everybody. And thanks again, Jeff, and we'll talk soon. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, man.